Arnie Gunderson is an energy advisor with Fairwinds Associates, with 39 years of nuclear power engineering experience. During his career in the nuclear industry, he coordinated projects at 70 nuclear power plants around the country and co-authored the first edition of the Department of Energy's decommissioning handbook. He is now offering analysis on the Fukushima situation and the ramifications of that disaster on the nuclear industry. This is the Global Research TV feature interview for grtv.ca with your host, James Corbett, and our special guest, Arnie Gunderson. You know, I, I think that's really important. Uh, in Japan, it seems to me like the, uh, the priority of uh, TEPCO was uh, uh, TEPCO first, the, the government of Japan second and the, and the people of Japan third. Uh, they were, on the first several days of the accident, uh, I, think, I think in the back of senior management's minds, they were still planning on starting these units back up. And, and hence the argument over whether or not to put salt water in. I think the plant manager clearly understood that the situation was out of control. He had lost the unit and he needed to put salt water in. But yet TEPCO at senior levels was, was clearly thinking about restarting that unit up. Same thing happened on Three Mile Island. Uh, I, I studied that and, and management said, well, you know, in a week or so, we'll get this thing started up again. Whereas the plant manager knew how serious it was. Anyway, who's in charge in, in Japan? It has seemed to me for a long time that uh, Tokyo Electric had, had more power at the table than did the Japanese government. Then perhaps the Japanese government is slightly worse than here in Japan, but, but here in the U.S., but really not a, a whole heck of a lot. Um, here in the U.S., we've got the industry trade group, NEI, and when they come to the table, they uh, carry a lot of political weight. The Congress um, has never approved a commissioner who NEI, the nuclear trade group, didn't approve before it got to Congress. So there's a, I don't think the, um, the, the people of Japan should be uh, uh, feeling as if they're unique, that um, TEPCO had a, a, a stranglehold on the government of Japan that didn't happen elsewhere in the world. It, it is happening here in the U.S., and, um, and it's a concern. Uh, it, it, uh, I, and I also believe it happens in France and, um, and, and also in China. That, that's a remarkable fact, and, and I wasn't even aware of that. So, so there has never been a, a nuclear commissioner who has not been a, a approved beforehand by the, the industry itself. I mean, what does that speak to the, the relationship between those, uh, the industry and the regulators that are supposedly watching over them? Actually, it, it, I shouldn't say never. Since 1994, so for the last 17 years, there hasn't been a commissioner that hasn't been uh, vetted by the, um, uh, by the Nuclear Energy Institute. You know, we had a, a senator here, Pete Dominici, uh, from uh, Arizona or New Mexico, and he's, he wrote a book about how he forced the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to be more industry compliant. Um, he met with the uh, head of the uh, nuclear the, the the chairman of the nuclear regulatory commission, uh, and and um, it was a woman at the time, and she said that uh, Shirley Jackson, and she said that um, uh, he forced her to speed up licensing because he threatened to cut the budget, and uh, in half. And uh, and he actually brags about that in his book. So this is not something that's um, um, unknown to the public. It's actually in, in print. Uh, we've also seen it um, recently. Uh, there's a commissioner, Merrifield, who, uh, while he was a commissioner, his, his time on the commission was winding down. He went looking for work, and he contacted on, on his personal office phone the people who he was regulating, and he said, hey, I need a job. Um, after he got a job, he made decisions as a commissioner that favored the company he was going to work for. So this is not a, a, a situation unique to Japan. This is a situation that's, um, that's global. The, Barry Commoner had a, uh, an expression years and years ago, back in the 60s or early 70s, and he, he used the term a nuclear priesthood. 
And uh, it has become that, you know, the, the, the people that run these reactors um, seem to think that the public has no opinion that's um, reasonable in the, um, in the long-term decisions about nuclear safety. And when they don't get their way with the regulator, they run over to Congress and, and apply pressure. And the same thing was true at TEPCO. Well, I, I suppose that isn't really surprising for, for a public that has long become used to the revolving doors in so many aspects of the government, in, from uh, the former Treasury Secretary being Goldman Sachs and, and all sorts of revolving doors, Monsanto and other such uh, things. But it's uh, very it particularly worrying when it's dealing with something as sensitive as nuclear safety. Um, and that raises the question, I guess the twin questions of how this has come to pass in the first place and then what can actually be done about this uh, relationship. Um, wow. <laughs> I think there's a book there. <laughs> the, uh, um, if you, if you go back to how it began, you know, clearly this all started because of the weapons program. And, uh, we had, um, a technology in place, diffuse gaseous diffusion for enrichment that, um, that, that had other applications. So it went into the nuclear Navy and then from the nuclear Navy, it went into, uh, commercial power plants. There were other decisions that could have been made back in the 1950s and 1960s that might have resulted in a safer nuclear power plant, um, but it wouldn't have been a uranium-based enriched uranium plant like, like we have in Japan or that we have in the United States. But the decision to go with the type of plant we have was driven because to build our weapons, we needed the gaseous diffusion enrichment plants. Um, so we are where we are. The, um, the, the plants are, um, uh, the, the plants are, good. this issue of decay heat, you know, when the uranium atom splits, these pieces remain highly radioactive. That issue um, would not have been as significant had the industry done other alternatives years ago. Um, now, I think to answer your question succinctly, it boils down to money. Um, Wall Street in the U.S. is not funding new nukes because they're way too expensive and we're relying on uh, uh, you know, taxpayer guarantees. And, and an event like Fukushima pushes up that threshold even higher. Um, I, I think um, it's not about being pro-nuke or anti-nuke. It's about does the money make sense? And when you properly look at the risks, and the, um, the, the financial risks, uh, I think that more and more boards, boards of directors, are going to make the decision that th there's got to be another alternative out there rather than to build a new nuclear plant. Well, I think you're right. It's certainly going to become an economic decision. And uh, we've seen signs of that already. For example, uh, Sellafield in Britain is apparently mm -hmm. uh, stopping its MOX production because the uh, Jap Japanese uh, uh, demand just isn't going to be there in, in the wake of Fukushima. How else do you think uh, Fukushima is going to play out in the near term? And then in the long term, I mean, do you think there is room left for a nuclear industry uh, or will it, uh, will it wither away as the, uh, the economic economics of it makes it basically unfeasible? Um, I, I, I hope that the Japanese um, uh, physicians uh, accurately measure and monitor and report the health effects that will occur after Fukushima. Um, I, I firmly believe that there'll be, a, a, over the next 20 years, a million additional cancers in Japan as a result of the Fukushima incident. Now. Whether or not that gets properly recorded is, is my, personally, my biggest concern um, because I think government pressures will want to downplay that and industry pressures will want to downplay that. We saw that at Three Mile Island. We saw that at Chernobyl. The difference here is that we do have the Internet now, which we didn't have you know, 30 years ago when those accidents occur. So uh, I think as that information gets out, over the next five years, there would be an increase in thyroid and lung cancers. And out at about 10 years, you begin to see the organ cancers. Um, as that information gets out, um, I believe that that'll factor into decisions on new nukes on, a, um, on an emotional level. Um, 
But the industry has already acknowledged in trade magazines that they're expecting a 10 to 20 percent increase in cost. Now, uh, here in the States, uh, um, an old nuke, that one that's been running now for uh, years, has at most cost a billion dollars, and for my Yankee, cost a couple hundred million dollars. And now that same nuclear plant is costing 20 billion dollars. So the capital cost is somewhere between 10 to, to 50 times higher than the cost that we were used to for nuclear power. So the argument that nuclear power is cheap may have hold, held true for these 440 plants that are operating, but it doesn't hold true for the, um, for the new plants. Then when something costs $20 billion and um, and when it breaks... It breaks for good. It does. It's not like not like a coal plant. You know, when a coal plant breaks, it it may kill one or two workers, and in three weeks you've got it running again. When a nuclear plant breaks, it's down for forever. So the the, the risk of a um, of, of an accident are significant, and the capital cost is enormous. When that happens, it seems to me that um, I think boards of directors are going to look for alternatives to that gen that way to generate power.